So in beginning chapter two, um, it's probably helpful to uh, categorize uh, the three broad types uh, of businesses or business models that uh, that we see out there. And of course, understand this is a broad categorization. We have uh, manufacturing uh, uh, businesses. Uh, we also have merchandising businesses, and this is uh, your Best Buy, for example, that uh, they buy the product, put it on shelves, and they sell it out the door. Manufacturing is a typical General Motors. They make something. And then you have service-oriented businesses, uh, law firms, dentists, things like that. Now, merchandisers purchase their uh, inventory, and we'll just uh, categorize that there as inventory. They purchase their inventory, put it on the shelves, customers come in, they pick it up, go to the cash, uh, walk out, and uh, that is how sales are generated. So they're sometimes called box pushers. Have you ever heard the term box pushers? But the purchases that they do make get classified as cost of goods sold. So we have our revenues in sales and our cost of goods sold. Service companies, on the other hand, just make sales. They don't necessarily have inventory, or if they do, it's just a very small component of what they do. Manufacturing companies, on the other hand, and I'll use General Motors, do carry inventory. They have cars. And they sell those cars, not to you and I, but they sell them to dealerships. But they do have inventory. But they do not purchase their inventory and then sell it. They produce. So instead of purchases, they have production that go into the cars. And all these costs of production go into cost of goods sold. So this really sets up the, uh, the conversation we're going to have for, uh, uh, for Chapter 2. We're going to focus uh, down here. Let me make a note. We're going to focus uh, primarily on manufacturing companies, the three different levels of inventory, the classification of manufacturing, non-manufacturing cost. I'm jumping ahead, but I'm just giving you a high-level look. Once we understand how manufacturing companies track costs, it's easy to apply it to a merchandising company simply because it simplifies down to simply just inventory. We don't have to worry about production costs. We know exactly what the cost of goods sold are. So let's uh, move on to, uh, um, remember now we're talking about a manufacturing company. We need to first, before we get right into how we do a lot of cost accounting, we need to classify costs. So we're going to look at two broad categories, manufacturing costs and non-manufacturing costs. Remember, our manufacturing costs end up in cost of goods sold, so we also call them product costs because they end up in the product itself before it's sold. So we call it a product cost. And we have three categories of manufacturing costs. We have direct materials. Can you guess what the other two are? If you read the chapter, then, uh, then you know what they are. The next one would be obviously direct materials. You need some raw materials... Uh, sorry, direct labor. You need some labor to take those materials and convert them. So direct materials, direct labor, and finally, it's got to be done somewhere. So we have manufacturing overhead. And these are our three broad product costs or manufacturing costs. So let's take a moment and figure out what goes into each of them. And we'll see that the third one, manufacturing overhead, is quite simple. For direct materials, what we're looking at are costs that can be traced to a particular product. So let's take GM again uh, as an example. And the seats that go in the cars can be traced. Every car has a certain number of seats. The seats cost money when GM bought the seats to put in the car. They can be traced. That is a direct material. Some costs cannot be traced. We would call those indirect materials. So a good example of indirect materials is the paint to paint the vehicle. You don't buy the paint in just the size needed for that one particular vehicle. You buy them in large quantities and you spray the paint on the vehicle, some taking more, some taking less. So that is called indirect because you cannot trace it directly to the product. Direct labor, it's also known as, aka, touch labor. Um, again, it's traceable. You can trace the cost to the product. So a line worker, 
for example, that is touching the, the inventory, touching the material as it goes by, that's a direct labor cost. We also have indirect labor. Now, indirect labor are uh, people who work in the factory that do not touch the product. So a good example would be the custodian. It's necessary to clean the factory, but because they don't touch the product, they're not considered direct labor. Also a supervisor. Supervisors may, may supervise many different lines of production, uh, and you can't trace their salary to just one uh, item. And finally, manufacturing overheads. All other manufacturing costs <clears throat> that are not direct labor or direct materials. So all other manufacturing costs, these include uh, the utilities for running the factory. Uh, while we're in the factory, let's uh, throw rent in there, uh, rent for uh, uh, running it, uh, perhaps, and depreciation of equipment, depreciation of the building. In other words, anything that's not direct material or direct labor is manufacturing overhead. Now let's move on to our non-manufacturing costs, and you're probably more familiar with these types of costs. And non-manufacturing costs are what we call period costs, as opposed to manufacturing costs, which are product costs. They're period costs because they don't go into a product, they just go right onto the income statement in the period in which they're incurred, and which is why we call it a period cost. So, there are two broad categories here of period costs or non-manufacturing costs. We have our marketing or selling costs, and this is the costs involved in selling or marketing our finished goods, our marketing or selling costs. And, well, we have an overall business to run, so we must have some administrative costs. The CEO, the executives, uh, the accounting department, the IT department, etc. Anything that's not in the factory. So we would call those administration costs. So those are our two broad categories, manufacturing costs and our non-manufacturing costs. This is going to be critical when we get to later chapters. So let's make a, a very critical note here. I want you to keep this in mind throughout the course. Manufacturing costs are also known as product costs. If we're trying to distinguish between a product and a period cost, simply ask yourself, is this a manufacturing cost? If it is a manufacturing cost, it's a product cost, period. We also call them inventoriable costs because these costs don't hit the income statement until a final product is sold. Let's make a note of that. Let's write this down. This is important. Make a note of this in your notes. They appear on the income statement, all these costs appear on the income statement under the category cost of goods sold. They appear as cost of goods sold <clears throat> when a finished good is sold, not when the costs of production incur. So we could incur a lot of costs in the month of January to produce something and not sell that product till March. As far as the income statement is concerned, there were no costs associated in January with production. They all occur in March when the invent when the finished goods are sold. That's very important to understand that production costs are carried in inventory. They become an asset, not an expense. They're only expensed when the item is sold. When we look at non-manufacturing costs, on the other hand, uh, these, <clears throat> you'll recall, are what are, are called period costs because they occur within a specific period of time, the CEO's salary. So uh, for January, February, March, for January, we may have production costs with no sales. We wouldn't have any cost of goods sold, but would still have a period cost for the CEO salary. So they appear on the income statement when they are incurred as opposed to when they're actually sold. So production costs don't appear on the income statement when they're incurred. They appear on the income statement when the final good is sold. Whereas period costs are there as incurred. And this all, both of these statements are consistent with an accounting principle that we know very well called the matching principle. We want to match our expenses with our revenues in the period in which they're incurred. So, if we sell something in March, we want the cost of goods sold to be reflected in the month of March, not in the month of January when it was actually produced. If you are following along with the textbook, if you look at Exhibit 
2.1 on page 31, you'll see a nice summary of uh, what we've just talked about uh, in this uh, in 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 this uh, in this video.